It probably isn't. Uh, we've seen this movie before, and I, I did the analysis just for internal purposes, showing how our banking sector held up during previous economic shocks. Mm -hmm. It has held up better for good reasons. We have a very strong banking system. We have a very strong regulator. Mm -hmm. We have a more, I would say, a more organised market than, than other parts of the world. That doesn't help people. It doesn't help calm people's nerves because there's always a, this time's going to be different. What do we know now? Or what's new that's different to the last time that it worked? So when you hear, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, maybe some people knew about them, maybe some people just everyone's heard of Credit Suisse. So when, when the bigger banks start to get into trouble, it, it generally makes people nervous. And mm -hmm. it's almost a case of, well, I don't care how solid the Australian banking system is, do I need to be invested in the banking sector is a common discussion uh, people have at the moment. And at the moment, the fear versus greed argument Fear is winning, share markets have been down. Um, even though our fundamentals remain sound, uh, much better than the other side of the world, yeah. people are going to want to see some evidence before um, racing back into equity markets. So. As opposed to cash, because obviously we're finally getting a return on our cash investments, it has to be a gold stock. Um, we're finally seeing the flight to quality that isn't flight to safety, that isn't Bitcoin in, in some people's minds. Gold is getting back to where it would normally be in times of uncertainty, around the $2,000 uh, an ounce. Um, you want a, a large liquid gold producer, Australian based, that pays a small dividend. For me, that's Northern Star. It's, uh, its market cap is over 12.5 bill before this morning. It's up again today, pays a small dividend. You'd expect the if this volatility continues, the Aussie, uh, the US dollar gold price to keep rallying. And if the Aussie dollar continues to weaken, I think it's at 67 cents as of this morning, that's the double positive. So gold companies are probably good diversifier in normal conditions anyway. In times of excess volatility, as we have at the moment, you've got to own a large liquid gold company. And for me, it's uh, Northern Star. Got it. I had a look at it this morning. Uh, for me, it's a sell, uh, primarily because uh, it's burning cash. Uh, I never pronounce it correctly. The spodumene price mm -hmm. uh, has been going the wrong way for it um, up until very recently. So, its share price, like many commodity players, has just tracked the commodity it, it, it produces. So, in this case, spodumene, so it's fallen, um, fallen backwards. But for me, cash burning company, it's not well covered, but looking at what's in consensus, it needs 50 to 100 million dollars in cash injection in the next two years, maybe 50 million each year. So, for me, You'll get it at some stage. You're going to have to tap the market, and you'll get a chance to buy it lower. And then, if, they, if the capital markets are shut, they're going to struggle to um, to continue uh, at the current cash rate. So, for me, it's a cash burner, not in the most ideal commodity. If it was gold or if it was iron ore, they seem to be flavour of the month at the moment. I, I would have a closer look, but uh, lithium at the moment, I would avoid this one because of its need, it, short term needs for cash, and I'm just not positive many cash burners at the moment. So, it's a sell for me. Yeah, it, it's a quality business and it's certainly developed a dominant market share in Australia. Uh, my concerns with the company are the US, which is about 20% of its profits based on the first half result. Its first half was down 30%. It's a debt collector, for one yeah. of a better phrase. It buys debts off, it buys ledgers off the banks and then it cents in the dollar and then spends more time collecting it than the banks would, so it makes a profit that way. Uh, we're just now starting to see the issues with rising interest rates and rising defaults. So if they've priced their ledgers based on most recent um, default rates, Clearly those are going up, maybe they won't make a profit on those books that they thought, particularly in the US where we're really cranking the, um, cranking the handbrake over there and the banking issues are emerging in the US, not in Australia. So for me, it's not a screaming buy, it's a watch out, eyes wide open, it's probably cheap. Uh, I would actually err on the side of just selling it because you'll get it's a liquid enough stock, you'll get a chance to buy it back once we see how the next six months play out in the US. But in my opinion, uh, their, the, their industry conditions in the US are getting a lot more challenging uh, with credit growth slowing, with the false rates going up. Their profitability has to look challenged going forward. So for me, it's not a sector I'd be investing in at the moment. It's, it's a sell. I, I tend to agree. I, I would consider it a sell. Uh, $1.35 NTA, it is trading a discount to that and it does pay a healthy 6% fully franc dividend yield. If you look at the list of funds, They've got a lot of quality fund managers on the list. Just looking at the list alone, you think this is an investment worth considering. And you look at the track record, nearly 200 basis points, 2% below its benchmark over a long enough period of time that yep. you just can't deny that that is an issue, a question you need to ask. So it, I don't think it's the fund managers, I think it's something to do with the con portfolio construction or how they manage the cash flow or how they time the investment, but it's too good a lineup to deliver that amount of underperformance over that longer period of time 
that's enough to say avoid, as look at hearts and minds or look at even one of the underlying funds on their own. It, it is a feel good investment, but yeah. not if you're losing 200 basis points versus the benchmark, that doesn't make you feel very good. Mm -hmm. right. Well, there is your answer, Tim. I do hope that that helps you in regards to your thinking about future generation global FGG is the ticker code there. Well, we are motoring right along in this program. Let's get to Southern Cross Electrical. And I'm typing it in because I actually don't know where it's trading and, and really um, what it does. Uh, Philip, are you familiar with this one? Yeah, uh, it pro we, we like the space. It provides, for want of a better phrase, electrical products, electrical components to the construction it's, it's industry. It, it, engineering, yeah. yeah. But think of a building, like there's a lot of the stuff that's behind the screens that you can't see behind the walls. They supply those sorts mm -hmm. of products. So it, it is it is a growth space. It, it is um, linked to the construction space. It has some quality clients in yeah. BHP, Rio, Multiplex, Coles, Woolworths. So it's quite diversified. Uh, it goes across um, multiple sectors, not just mining, um, industrials uh, and infrastructure as well. So we really like the space. Um, my issue with it is they're not growing. So solid first half, but they're guiding to flat to a slightly down second half. The reason for that is there's some really large resources work that's rolling off. So their forward order book uh, is actually reducing. So companies like this, they need to keep growing. So in order for investors to get excited, you need to show some sort of earnings growth, whether it's EBITDA, EPS or something. Uh, their guidance is basically flat to down. And if they don't replenish some of the large uh, licks of work coming off, it's very hard for them to outperform um, uh, without that. Having said that, they haven't flagged it, but they've mentioned uh, they're expecting some positive news in the second half given work they're tendering on in Sydney in the areas of commercial buildings, data centres, hospitals and rail. So those are sectors that a lot of infrastructure has been. We know it's coming because you can, you can see it in the data. So if they win those, it'll get a kick along. If they don't win any of those, the share price will probably slide because they've gone next grow. So I'm going to call it a hold. There's some potential catalysts to come through. Uh, the fact that they're calling out the sectors, hopefully they're confident they can win some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they don't win any, I think the stock will struggle. So I'm going to call it a hold. So would you say that this is a company that suffered because it has had sort of too much risk or too much, um, too much association with one sort of sector up till now, being the resources space? I call it uh, uh, suffering from their own good work, good mm -hmm. luck. So they won some large contracts in the, in the resources space mm -hmm. that are rolling off and the, the contracts that they're adding on aren't big enough to replace what they're losing. And the problem with analysts is they don't smooth, they don't mean, they say, well, you did plus 10 last time, now you're doing minus 10. Yeah. Over the two year period was probably fine, but versus the prior corresponding period, you're actually going backwards. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem is, although they're diversified, they've had one or two contracts that were actually quite large and they're rolling off. Mm -hmm. So okay. they're suffering from their own success. Yeah. Um, will mean revert, but most, most simple people like me like to see earnings go up from year to year. And if, if the earnings aren't going up, then people tend to wait. Yeah, you, you take the point on the balance sheet, Philip? No, agreed. It's holding a lot of cash. Um, some small cap investors can go that small, but to our point earlier, in this market, liquidity is your friend, mm. and certainly companies above a billion are much more favoured than those below a billion. So you wouldn't rush in to buy it today, but if you owned it, you would happily bottom draw it and, and, and wait for it. Okay, good one. Thanks, guys. Let's get to Grange Resources, which is the next on the list. And Grange Resources has been requested by Matthew. So I don't have a lot of context. I don't know if he's already holding Grange. Um, are you bullish on this stuff? I'm going to call it a buy. Um, it's, it's an iron ore producer. It's last couple of years has done a consistent 2.6 million tonnes. However, with the volatility in the iron ore price, its revenue and profit fell in proportion to the iron ore price. So its profits, I'm going to call it halved um, last year or for the first half. Um, since November, the iron ore price is up 40%. Uh, so if you expect that really to continue, yeah. it's really it's hit 90 bucks a tonne. It's now 130 or something. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's that really snuck rough. up on us, didn't it? It did. So <laughs> the very, as my former colleague used to say, commodity stocks follow the commodity prices up. So given the leverage it's already shown with the, um, with the iron ore price on the downside, if this continues, even if it just stays where it is and you get the pro rata, their second half should be very strong, or this current year should be very strong for them. So purely because of what the iron ore price has done, current levels, um, and the company's leverage to the iron ore price, even with volume staying flat at um, 2.6 million tonnes, 
I think it's a buy because you'll see pretty strong earnings come through in the second half and the balance of um, calendar year 23. So it's no more complex analysis than that other than positive view on the iron ore sector and uh, this 800 mil market cap, so it's, it's not big but it's not small, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd, I'd call it a buy. Oh, I'm verging between a hold and a sell. I should say sell just to be different, but mm -hmm. I'll stick to my hold, Rady. It offers lenders mortgage insurance. Yeah. We're yet to see that play out. Everyone talks about the mortgage cliff, the mortgage cliff. There was, um, is it 350 billion this year and next year to be refinanced. The banks are saying it's not a problem. It's all happening in an orderly manner. You'd have to think default rates have to go up and for those who have to take it out, they're probably the most stretched. So if we start to see um, default rates go up and the banks call on the mortgage insurers a lot more, you'd think they would be hit disproportionately versus the banks. It was a solid first half result. Oh, yeah. um, I spat out a lot of cash, a special and an ordinary dividend. If it wasn't for the buyback, 100 mil, which yeah. will support the share price, I would say sell into the strength. The, the buyback will hold it up for a period of time. So they're producing a lot of cash. It's, it's eyes wide open. I, I wouldn't call it a buy because interest rates are yet to bite. We know that. Uh, everyone's saying property's holding up, retail sales are holding up. Yeah, until it doesn't. Um, we'll see that in the remainder of the calendar year. It has to happen or the Reserve Bank will keep yeah. cranking. We'll certainly see it into next year. So for me, it's not a table thumping buy. It's the best is probably behind him. We'll never see those conditions in the foreseeable future, uh, wouldn't chase it, sell into the buyback um, and take your special divvy and um, Yeah, and I want to qualify my buy, it's a trading buy. Trading buy, <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. So I'm, I'm a trader, so that would, it would be yeah. a trading buy. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I, think, I think our viewers, well, many new viewers may not, but uh, yeah, David is a trader and uh, also considers things from fundamental but also technical perspective mm -hmm. as well. And, and I should do my daily reminder, this is information only. This is not financial advice. This is not tailored to your own specific circumstances. You need to do your own research or get financial advice uh, if you need to do so. All right, let's get to the next company on the list. It is Telix Pharmaceuticals. Uh, this one is for Steve. Uh, I'll start with you on this one, Philip. It's it's commercializing. I mean, it, it's it's selling stuff, which is not always, uh, you know, where we're at when it comes to Aussie listed biotechs. It's a good way to describe it. It's a complex biotech that's selling stuff, yeah. uh, and it, it's still burning money, but it's putting out positive announcements. And it's one of the few stocks that forces you to think longer term because you, you wouldn't buy this for an earnings upgrade. It has been, and I think continues to be a market darling. And it has, but I'm not going to pretend to be a biotech expert, but it has put out some good announcements in, in the areas of cancer research that it specializes mm -hmm. in and the market's reacted well to it. And it's flagged that there's more positive announcements coming. Um, still burning cash, but in markets like this, you need to encourage people to think longer term. A company like Telix, you wouldn't buy it for the next six months because you don't know. The announcements can be delayed, they can be brought forward. Uh, it's a great diversifier. It, it's a good business doing great things. Um, in terms of, I think it's bowel cancer research, prostate cancer research that they focus on. Um, I'm going to call it a buy um, for no other reason than they had a recent positive announcement regarding the products that they're selling. It is actually selling some product, mm -hmm. flagged potentially higher sales in the second half and more, uh, more products to come. So I'm going to call it for a buy for no other complex reason than that. It's a complex biotech that's selling stuff. Yeah. So I'll call it a, a buy. And this is long term. This Lo is something longer you term. have to, be, you longer know, this term. is not a short term trade. Yeah. I really want to call it a sell, but I can't. Uh, yeah. The fundamentals are too strong. I'm also teetering between a hold and a buy. Recent result was strong, not just for Qantas, but for all the travel stocks, yeah. corporate travel, Hello World, um, Flight Centre, all put out good earnings uh, results. When in doubt, always buy the market leader. Qantas is the market leader by, by daylight. Yeah, it has some government support, but it, it, it's, it's still the market leader. Um, consumers holding up, corporates holding up, despite extraordinary high prices. Um, so what that tells you, when and it will be when prices come down, demand will continue to rise. Right, people who probably couldn't afford to travel probably didn't stayed more domestically. They'll start to fly. Where at full employment will eventually um, increase uh, our unemployment levels. But there are corporates who would definitely be saying it's too expensive to fly. Let's do a Zoom. But when prices come down, um, that that will reverse. 
we're yet to see international travel really back to pre-COVID levels. So again, once sure foreign capacity will come on, but then demand it goes both ways. So um, the good times won't be here forever, but I'm not convinced that they'll disappear anytime soon. People would still rather fly than not. So I think the momentum that Qantas had in its first half will carry it through at least into the, the second half. I, I want to call it a sell. I can't. Conditions are just too strong. Mm. You're always back to market leader. So I'm actually going to call it a buy. It might only be 12 months, but in markets like today with, with other industries imploding, um, you know, the, the immediate future for the travel industry, you know, the oil prices, I think, were down again overnight. Mm. Uh, conditions aren't going to fall in a heap in a hurry if we manage the interest rate rises um, gradually. Um, I just can't see them suffering the earnings heap that retailers and, and other sectors will have. It won't be a sudden stop because there's still this pent up demand that isn't flying because of the price and the second Melbourne to Sydney becomes two to three hundred bucks again, everyone's mm. flying to Melbourne for the weekend to watch the real footy, not not, not the uh, NRL. Oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> well, I, I yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from. I think it's been, it's not a buy now, pay later, but it's been caught up in the whole buy now, pay later and concerns around the banks. Um, I'm going to call it a sell because it's in the wrong space. Um, Non-bank lender when other non-bank, well, other bank lenders are getting into trouble. Um, Credit growth is going to slow. We know that. There will probably be a flight to quality. The the bigger lenders, the bank lenders, will probably be more aggressive in trying to win market share and maintain market share. Funding costs are going up for everybody. um, Australia is much better managed than the US, but you saw what happens in the US when you haven't got your funding costs when you've got a mismatch between your borrowing costs and your lending costs, um, Mm. you can get some issues. So my view on the sector is there'll be a flight to quality, flight to bigger, bigger lenders, especially if you're, um, if you go through the broking network, which will probably win more share. I just think they're going to, it was, it was a solid first half result, good turn and market loves, the market loves when a company goes from loss making to profit making Mm. and yet we still have that chart. So people are looking for an opportunity to exit. I just think it'll struggle to attract eyeballs. I would wait six months, uh, probably even 12 months to see where does mm. their loan book settle, where did the default rate settle, can they actually attract money from the tier one lenders going forward. And I personally, I think they'll struggle. Uh, it's 30 mil market cap. It's on nobody's radar at, at that size. So I, I would call it an avoid. Okay. Uh, it's speculative, it's speculative <laughs> yeah. though. Um, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't okay. put 10% of the super fund in it. As, as no, as that's as right. I, I think it's a sell. There's been a few of these listed. It's a very tough space. Mm. They had a pretty ordinary result where their loss doubled from, I think it was 18 mil to 42 mil for Not the a great period. Trade there. Um, lost a material. Uh, I had a judgment against them. West Gem uh, was 250 mil against them about six months ago. Bleeding cash. Um, it's a funding litigator. Funding costs going up. It's just not a sector you need to play in. It's, it's very volatile. It's, it's not for the faint-hearted. Uh, their recent track record hasn't been great. Share price. Share price, oh. people have been bailing out ever since the result. Uh, and that chart, I'm not a chartist, but I can tell you my experience, that doesn't turn around anytime soon um, with the outlook mm. they've given uh, and the cash that they're burning. Uh, it's just not a sector you need to play. It's, it's not a stock I would put in front of people. I, I would call it a definite sell. Philip, is David, you know, is it okay, while well, we still have a lot of this uncertainty, we don't know where this banking crisis will end, to just hold some cash right now? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Cash rates are going up, so you'd be you'd be crazy not to. All cash-like investments. Uh, some of the um, some of the larger companies we deal with are issuing convertible notes um, or bonds that give you a good return. So you have a kind of link to their earnings, but you're getting a yield, um, not a, not an equity um, link. So absolutely, you should be holding some cash at the moment because yeah. if markets fall, you want the firepower to buy the dips, as they say, a dollar cost down, average down, as opposed to by put 10% of one stock in your portfolio at once where you might get the timing wrong. Mm-hmm. 